Hola, hola. <laughs> Stepping the technology up to now have a selfie stick. Ah, so I'd like to share a quick video talking about a little bit about my journey with meditation and then a recent Vipassana silent meditation retreat that I attended and finally an offer that I'd like to share with anyone. The first five people who would like to attend, who, who do attend a Vipassana and go all the way through it, I share $500 a piece, no strings attached. So right now I'm in Malasaña, Madrid, which is the neighborhood that I used to live in uh, for a year when I was here for the MBA. And this is a this is a plaza that is right next to, right across from where I used to live. And I haven't been back here in four years. These days I don't really connect so much with cities. I much prefer to be in places with nature, but I, I wanted to come back. I was near here. I just attended the Vipassana retreat not far from here. I wanted to come back and explore for a few days. And the energy of, of Madrid and the energy of Malasaña is so, and Spain, you know, they, they have a unique energy. And this, like this plaza right now, it's, it's actually pretty low key. This is, this is, what time is it now? Seven, 7 p.m.? So this is early for, for Spanish people, you know. Come 9 or 10 p.m., this place will be full with people in their teens and 20s kicking footballs and drinking beers and older people, all ages, families pushing, pushing their children and their strollers and everything. So anywho, my journey with meditation. Um, I had heard of it for... I, I believe my uncle probably shared about Vipassana meditation with me probably 15 years ago. And back then it was, it was just outside of my bubble. And then maybe 2013, 2013 I believe, is when I might have first begun doing attempts at meditation. I had listened to people like Tim Ferriss, who has a podcast if you're not familiar. T-I-M space F-E-R-R-I-S-S -S -S. and he interviews lots of people who are at the top of their top of their game in all different sorts of industries or whatever and so many of these successful people said meditation was a part of their life and so I thought okay it must be something here. so I began using applications to try and do like 10 minutes you know so there's an application in Headspace there's one named Calm I believe there's, there's probably a ton now I don't know and it, I was just trying to do 10 minutes a day or five minutes a day. And I, I was struggling with that for years to get anything. Uh, and it wasn't really until 2018, after I came back to the United States after living here, uh, and I had these really eye-opening experiences being in another culture and experiencing different values and all of these blind spots that I had after living just in the United States and only being in other countries for short snippets of time, I realized I had, I had, I had so many assumptions about what is beneficial or positive or whatever, and that was largely due to the culture that I had been in. And I also had my first psychedelic experiences here in Spain, and you know, when that happens, the worldview just opens up. So I came back to, the, I went back to the United States and I began, actually I heard on National Public Radio about a, the local VA, Veterans Administration, and me being a veteran, my ears perked up, and the local VA offering like a simple meditation class. And me, in the mindset that I was back then, I was like, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm smarter and cooler than that. I'm sure it's going to be very basic, but let me just go anyway, because I'm surprised that the VA is even doing anything like that, because it's such a big bureaucracy and it's in the world of the Western allopathic, you know, give someone a bunch of pills, but doing something like meditation, wow. So I went 
and I learned some things. And it was a meditation from this man named Eknath Eswaran, E-K-N-A-T-H space E-A-S-W-A-R-A-N, I believe. He's an Indian man who came over to the United States. He was a Rhodes Scholar or something like that. Um, and he came over and he wrote several books. One of them is named Strength in the Storm. And I've given that book to many people as a nice introduction to meditation in this whole sort of world. It's very light, it's very easy, but it has still has depth and it still has tools that really assist. And it greatly assisted me, it's assisted multiple of my friends. So I began doing his type of meditation, which is, it's, a, it's an easy meditation. There's, it, it's called passage meditation. For 20 minutes, repeat over and over in the mind, some sort of positive passage, generally from some sort of spiritual text of whatever sort, you know, it doesn't matter, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, uh, non-denominational, whatever, something, but something that has a strong positive message, so it's subconsciously going into the brain, and something that has been used by millions of people, so it's got strong energy. So I did that, I attended a brief, I don't know, three or five day retreat up in Northern California where he was previously living, he's no longer alive. And that was kind of when meditation first began becoming real funny. And I had known because of Tim Ferriss and because of researching neuroscience and things, I had known that there are tons, of, I forget, I just heard a statistic recently, I forget, a few thousand or many hundreds of studies on meditation and the impacts on the brain and impacts on mood and emotions. It's, it's, it's very clearly shown that this has great benefits in the brain and in the subsequently in the psyche and subsequently in the rest of life, you know? So I, ha I was going about it back then in that way. It was, it was not experiential knowledge yet. But I began experiencing it from these short, from these 20 minute meditations, began really enjoying it. And at that time in 2018, I was really exploring how to, I was in, really into what we called life hacking, which is like understanding how to do all these different things to really maximize performance or efficiency or evolution or whatever. And so I had, was learning about building habits and patterns and routines. And so I began building morning routine and part of that was meditation, which I had read from so many other people. It was a big part of their lives. So that progressed for about a year. Then I began uh, doing Dr. Joe Dispenza meditations. If you're not familiar, Dr. Joe, his last name is D-I-S-P-E-N-Z-A. He's a doctor and he, he's written multiple books. I've read three of them, I believe. He, he, he takes neuroscience and quantum physics and he breaks it down into like really understandable and really actionable information for about how people can take ownership of, of their physical and their psychological experience, including like healing using using the internal placebo effect, i.e. the body healing itself, learning how to, un to utilize that effect so that not requiring external things like a lifetime of pharmaceuticals and going to a doctor who doesn't have time to talk to you or something like that. So I began doing his meditations. I did those for about really probably at least a year and a half, but not just specifically his. By that time I had experience with neuro-linguistic programming and lots of information about visualization and again neuroscience and that sort of thing. So I would craft my own, taking from all of these different things that I had learned. Those are kind of the main meditation practices. And then when I did the 93 days in dark retreat in India, it was kind of a combination of that. But earlier that year, while I was in India, I read the book named The Art of Living. And it's a book basically with the things that are shared in Vipassana meditation retreats. It's about Vipassana and it shares those things, but in book form. And so I took from that and I, wow, that's exciting because we kind of moved out of this, we moved into into the, the realm of 
really tried and true stuff. This is this is vipassana is a word that means insight meditation or wisdom meditation to the best of my understanding. You know? It's in that ancient language of Pali, which is the language that was spoken in northern India when Buddha was alive 2,500 years ago. So Buddha is very well documented throughout history as, as having existed. Right? He is a, he's a human being. He never claimed to be spirit, like a, a reincarnation of God or any sort of holy person or anything. He was just a person who dove really deeply into himself to understand where does suffering come from. I feel I experience suffering continually, mentally and physically. I see it everywhere else. Where does it come from and how can I release it? And he dove deeply inside and he discovered these these things. The first one being Anicca. Everything is impermanent. Everything is changing all the time. This next one being Dukkha. Human beings who are not enlightened, which is the vast majority of us, we experience suffering continually about everything because everything is changing all the time and yet we latch on to things and we have attachment to things and so we try to hold on to something that is impermanent, that's always changing. We want a relationship to last, we want our career to last, we want our financial position to last or we, vice versa. Like we want where we're at to be different and we don't recognize it's going to be different. Instead, we get all upset about where we're at and say this is how we're gonna be forever. So Anicca, everything is permanent dukkha, suffering is continual. And then there's a third one which I won't go into because it's beyond the scope of this kind. And so with that, he began exploring, going into, okay, well, how can I be free of that? And he discovered this technique, which is a very simple technique. As they say, you know, you can tell a true master or a true teacher because they're able to share things that are very deep, but they share them simply. There's no secrets. You don't got to read 20 books. You don't got to put together the calculations of, you know, square root of pi times infinity. Like, it's simple. Anyone can do it. And, you know, Jesus said the same thing. Right? Be still and know. Know thyself. These are, these are common throughout religions, but beyond religions, these are common throughout history. As someone who has experienced enlightenment, they say, be still and know thyself. And so this is what, this is what um, <laughs> Buddha shared. And so Vipassana, it means insight meditation. You gain insight into these three that are, into the three. Anicca, Dukkha, and the third one being Anatta, basically, that this is not actually me. I'm not this solid thing that I believe that I am. I am also changing. And so he, he discovered techniques for that. And uh, he, he shared them with hundreds of thousands, millions of people back then. And it spread around the world. And subsequently, it is still being taught. And so the Vipassana organization is an organization, it's a nonprofit organization started by an Indian man who was born in Burma named Goenka. Now we call it Goenka G. It's in India, when you put G on the end of someone, J I, it's a sign of respect. And so Goenka G, he, he was a businessman and he suffered from debilitating migraines for many years and he became somewhat addicted to, to opioids because that's what he was treated with for this pain. And, uh, what an interesting story. We never heard that before. People being given opioids and becoming addicted. So this was in the 50s and 60s, I believe. And he subsequently connected with an instructor in Myanmar who taught him this technique and he experienced great benefit. He brought it to India to teach his, his mother and shared with some other friends and subsequently it spread and he created this organization, the Vipassana organization. It's 100% free. It's 10 days you go there. Uh, there, are, there are centers, uh, there's probably a dozen or so in the United States and then there's many around the world. Uh, there's two here in Spain, there's a few in you know, other countries in Europe. There's many in India and in Asia and things like that. So there's, there's many around the world. Go there for 10 days. It's, it's called the Noble Silence. So not speaking to any of the other participants. When I was there, I think there was about 80, about 40 men and 40 women. 
probably one third of those are people who have attended a course already, such as myself, and two thirds are people who it's brand new. And people of all backgrounds, all ages. There was a young man, 23 years old there. Uh, you know, there are old, older people in their 60s and people with no meditation experience, people with other meditation experience. It's completely free. You're given food, of course, and place to stay. And then every day you're taught this very simple but very deep practice and given time to practice this over and over for 10 days so you can experience the benefit firsthand. It's completely non-sectarian. It's not connected to any religion. It's open for everyone. So I, as I mentioned, my uncle shared about this probably 15 years ago. And then I read the book on it, about it, um, in the beginning of 2020, uh, spring of 2020. And then the January of 2021, I sat my first Vipassana in India and it was fantastic. <laughs> I mean, as with anything, something new, that's something that's outside of our comfort zone or our, our experience base, there, and as with all of life, there are ups and there are downs. And when we're in a situation like this where we're not having any of the external distractions that we're used to, that we've been using to avoid actually being with ourselves, we don't have no phone, we have no sex, we have no alcohol, we have no smokes, we have no friends, we have no children that we're caring for, we have no work, we have no whatever books, you know, whatever story that we use to avoid being in silence with ourselves, we have none of that. And so it opens, and then this technique is a technique that goes very deep. It's very well documented that this can lead and has led for hundreds and thousands of years to enlightenment. There are, there are living people that have, you know, they have been taking, taken into MRIs and they scan their brain waves and they see that, that their, their brain waves are in brainwave states that Western science didn't even know existed. They'd never seen before. And these are people who can drop into that after meditation. And then there are people at, like a man that I'll share later where that's just his baseline. They thought the MRI machine was broken because he was having brainwave states that they didn't understand that like didn't make sense to him. So there are ways that science is now attempting to verify things which you know we can also just see from experience when we meet someone who is in, a, in an enlightened state their energy the way that they interact the way that they communicate just everything it's different okay it's not so common in the west and i can't say that i'm aware of having met anyone myself but now i know in the last two years as i have been connecting more with people in these worlds now i know of multiple people who are living and i've of more people who just recently died books by them and whatnot so anyway you can you can believe that or not it's, it doesn't doesn't change the fact that this technique what it does is it assists with focus so in the west and in you know what the medicine slash psychiatry industry there's they're big fans of using labels and saying oh this is how someone is and they're born this way and they're always going to be this way and they're going to need a bunch of pills for the rest of their life so we have words like um, schizophrenia or ADHD or manic depressive you know these are these people are this okay so schizophrenia you know like tell me who of you, of you or people that you know like doesn't have different voices doesn't have different confusion in their mind i'm not discounting people who experience schizophrenia i believe that it's something that people can experience absolutely and i have compassion for that but i don't believe that it's something that someone is stuck with adhd how many people do you know who don't have some sort of challenge with making decisions and following through with them and not becoming distracted especially in this age where we're given phones that are specifically designed to, dis to distract, to hook in, they, it, you can read it, just Google it, it's very easy to find. People are paid millions of dollars to understand how to create applications and devices that hook people in and cause addiction. And so is it really surprised that now we have 
bunch of children and bunch of adults who have grown up with this sorts of things combined with, you know, unhealthy uses of caffeine and other things which damage focus. And so they have challenges because they have trained themselves unconsciously to not have focus. It's not surprising. You no know, manic depressive. How many people do you know don't sometimes have ups and sometimes have downs? Yes. I, I'm, I'm very familiar with people who have experienced manic depression because it's been a part of, of my life in different ways that I won't go into because it's not for me to speak on. But I'm very familiar with that, and so I'm not saying that that doesn't exist. But is it something that someone is stuck with their whole life? I personally don't believe that. And so this technique teaches how to bring focus in and then how to purify the mind, how to actually, you know, those, for, for many years of my life, uh, up until just a few years ago, I felt like, well, oh, fudge. When I was young, I saw really harmful, negative, dark pornography, and that stuff has stuck with me forever. Or I created these habit patterns when I was in my late teens and early 20s and, and mid 20s with having casual sex and you know, reinforcing those addictive patterns or drinking alcohol or whatever. And so I used to think, I'm stuck with that forever. That's, that's always going to be with me. You know, that's the message that we're taught. You are an alcoholic and you'll be an alcoholic for the rest of your life or whatever. You know, it's in your DNA or whatever. We're taught these disempowering messages about how we're weak and broken. And so I used to believe that. Well, this technique specifically, it assists to clear that out. Not saying that you become blank, you become a blank slate. It's that these things no longer have those emotional hooks. You know, when you see something that you currently have an addiction to, whether it's chocolate or a certain type of food or coming home at night and sitting on the couch and watching Netflix or some type of sexual experience or anger, you know, when, you, when someone does something that you have trained yourself to get upset about or victimhood, you know, where, where you tell this story and you feel these emotions about how you, woe is me, my life is so terrible and it's not fair or whatever this things. When you feel that, you feel how the body responds, how you feel these sensations in the body. Your heart starts beating at a different pace. Breathing starts to become maybe shallower, maybe faster. Feel these ripples. These, they feel pleasant, although we're because we've trained ourselves to enjoy them. We may say we don't like them, but it's what we keep going back to, right? Like we don't, we don't go to letting those go. We keep reinforcing them. We keep getting angry with people about things that aren't necessary, or we keep feeling bad about things that don't really matter and that are, if we wanted to, we would forget about by tomorrow, you know? We keep doing it. So this technique teaches to release that. Um, so, yeah. Uh, for me, it's been, it's been transformative. Of, I have experienced many things. I've experienced many workshops, many trainings, many courses, many retreats, many powerful psychedelic journeys, many coachings, many, all many different sorts of things. This has been my focus since 2018, and, and I've dedicated over $100,000 the majority of my life over of these years, however many years that is, five years. To, to this, and so I've experienced many different things. And for me, meditations, and then Vipassana meditation specifically, is, has been the most powerful. I, for the past year and a half, Vipassana meditation has been my sole practice, and I'm continuing that, not bringing in any other practices. I may, do, you know, learn other, like attend uh, different experiences about, learning about things, but not about bringing in different practices because for me it has been so powerful and I have seen many other people who it has been so powerful so I trust it I know it from personal experience and I trust the the science behind it when in in the Pashana courses where they share what Buddha learned it clicked when when I attended my first one it was like boom, click, because it clicked so much with all of the information that I had learned in neuroscience and in quantum physics, except Buddha's learning goes much deeper 
goes, it's much more holistic. Neuroscience and quantum physics is just beginning to scratch the surface, and it's not done from an experiential place, it's done from an observational place using technology, and so it can't bring about the same sort of results as going inside and experiencing it firsthand. So I attended that first retreat in, um, in India, and then I got on a train and I went to Bodh Gaya that evening. Bodh Gaya is the place where Buddha sat under the Bodhi tree and he experienced his enlightenment and subsequently began sharing this message. And so then I served a Vipassana course there, another 10 day. And serving is assisting. Everyone there is, is volunteer. Uh, it's all free, right? So uh, there I was assisting the teacher, and so I would meditate for the majority of the time, but I would also assist if the students, if the, if the meditators needed anything or anything like that. I, I served another one uh, a month or two later in, in India, and then I came to the United States. I continued my daily practice, but I got a bit disconnected. Uh, I got a bit, as I've mentioned before, last year, it was, a, it was an intense time going back to certain places that I have this history with as a, as a young person and challenges with family and whatnot. And so I, I continued the practice, but I got a bit disconnected and I didn't make time to attend another course. So this course that I sat here in Spain in the beginning of whatever this month is, June, uh, I, just, I just got out of it a few days ago. Uh, I stayed at the I stayed at the center for an extra couple days. It's a beautiful organization. You can stay for free. You know, I, I stayed. I'm getting food and place to stay. I'm helping out with things to help for the next course. So very simple. You know, folding laundry, cleaning, uh, paint some poles, and things like that. And what a beautiful way to run any sort of organization or team or family. Every day we would get together at 8 a.m and we would all meditate for an hour. And then again at 2 p.m. and again at 6 p.m. So we start the day with this peaceful, positive, calm connection with each other and with ourselves. And then, you know, midday we've had things going on, we've had interactions, we've had thoughts, whatever. Come back, recenter, have another meditation, and then end of the day, start winding down. So really beautiful. This retreat was very powerful for me. I realized that over the past year and a half of practice, in the beginning, I latched on to some of the minor ports of the technique. And it's a simple technique, and it's repeated a hundred some times over the course of the 10 days, you know? But our minds were coming from all different sorts of places. I was coming from this life hacker sort of place of trying to grab certain things and maximize and do that. And so I came with that space, and I latched on to some of these small minor parts and that has been my main practice, and I've been missing the main part of the practice. <laughs> like I thought I was doing it, but I realized in this in this course that I was not. And so I adjusted, and wow, the results were fantastic. I experienced things that I've, I've never experienced before, even in psychedelic journeys. And I won't go deeply into them because they're not the reason for the practice. The, the reason for the practice is that brings about real changes in the outside world you know I'm more peaceful and more equanimous now than I ever have been before in my life I have better relationships from a more healthy more empowering place with my family members with my partner with my friends and with any person that I meet on the street than I ever have had before in my life. Now this is due to all the things that I have been doing and it's due to me continuing in this direction and I'm very grateful for all of the things that I've experienced, all of the courses, all of the people who've put in effort to share things in one way or another. I'm very grateful for that but it's very largely due to the practice of Vipassana meditation whose focus is bringing equanimity in through the specific practice that helps to release these attachments to things. So yeah, just as a, as a quick share of like something that is possible, because in the West we don't know much about this sort of stuff, I'm sharing from personal experience, one of the days I sat without moving, in the same position, without moving, for over three hours, this is not, you know, that's not a, like some sort of requirement or something. Like you're taking, you're taking breaks throughout the day. But I sat for over three hours in meditation. And so I, initially I have 
for many years I've had strong stories about I have lots of knee pain because I was in the military and I damaged the knees and at the end of my career I was almost medically separated from the military because I wasn't able to run the mandatory physical fitness test for a period of months because my knees were so inflamed and so painful and the doctors all said oh you don't have any cartilage and it's going to be like this forever and you know classic sort of thing and so I've, I've believed that story for many years and I've told myself that um, but as we know if if you there's a book named the body keeps the score and that shares about how we store trauma and pain and psychological pain in our bodies. And this is, this is very well documented. You can also look up trauma release exercises. This is a, a doctor studied animals and then subsequently came up with these simple exercises. As he observed how animals, let's say a, the classic example is a gazelle being chased by a lion. When it gets away, it doesn't like break down psychologically and go tell all its friends and just, you know, become this shivering wreck of fear and paranoia and you can't leave the house, you know? It doesn't do that. It doesn't be, it doesn't create these trauma stories that have become so big in our Western society. I'm not saying don't acknowledge when someone experiences a traumatic event. A traumatic event is very different from trauma. Everyone experiences traumatic events. We've experienced them since we were born and we're going to experience them until we die. Creating trauma is when we focus on that traumatic event and allow it to become a story that rules us. So he observed that animals didn't do that and he observed that when the gazelle would get away, it would shake, 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 and it would shake this traumatic experience out of its body. And so he subsequently created these, or discovered these, these exercises that you do and causes the body to go into shaking. So there, there is, there's, this is real, this is real science, it's well known, the body, holds emotions in the physical body and so I believe that that is largely what has been in my knees um, in, at the time where my knee where I was having such strong knee pain also happened to be a time where I was in the darkest period of my life at the end of 2016 I just ended a relationship and I was really in the throes of sexual addiction. I was acting in ways that I really hated, but I felt I was out of control. It was just who I was, because I believed the stories back then. It's really strongly into alcohol. I was doing things, I was tearing my soul apart, you know? And also, wow, interesting, I was having physical manifestations. Psychosomatic is very real. Thing. So anywho, I'm in Vipassana here, I'm sit, I sit for three hours, it's very strong pains throughout the body and the back, lower back is another area. And then at some point, those pains transform. And, and this, this practice isn't focused about pain, but it is, we go into deeper levels than just this very base, very gross, oh, I can feel when I touch myself, but I'm so desensitized that I don't feel the wind blowing, you know, or like that. So this practice teaches us that and teaches as we go deeper we get to this next stage where it's just sensations it's not any of this story of this is a bad sensation this is a good sensation that's the next place that i went to so i'm sitting there i'm able to sit there continue sitting there for hours the mind initially is saying we can't do this we've got to go no we've got to change this change this is boring all this sort of thing it doesn't you know then I, then I began experiencing physical sensation and psychological sensation of dissolving to where the body dissolved. And it, I was now in this alternate state. When I came out of this, I, when I came to Vipassana, my back, my lower back was very tight. And like a month or two ago, I had, I had had an experience where my lower back was very sensitive. It's something that I'm familiar with every couple of you know, a handful of times a year or less where the back like goes out, you know? And this used to be another story that I had because my mother used to believe, oh, she has a bad back. And so I believed, oh, well, I must have inherited a bad back, you know? What is a bad back? Like, how did we evolve as human beings to get here after millions of years when we're born with bad backs? You know, we can't just even, we gotta lay in bed for days. Like, how did we survive? And so, when I came to the Vipassana, I was, I was able to bend maybe like this, you know, because the back was so sensitive and, and feeling such pain and whatnot. 
So after this three hours of sitting, where the normal mindset would be, okay, you've been sitting for hours, you're gonna be very tight, you're gonna be very sore, you need to stretch or whatever. I came out of that sitting and I could just feel my body was different and I just went like this, like I've never done before. And I was able to lay with my head on my on my knees like that, body feeling like rubber, feeling very flexible. I was able to like this. No crinkles, no pain. I, I, I normally have had like some pain right here, a sensitive area and one down here. No pain, just roll, 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 nothing. Body feeling like it is rubber. And I walked outside barefoot across gravel like rocks like this, white rocks that are pointy, barefoot, feeling like it's a massage. And what I realized, I would explore that after several days, what I realized is normally when I walk barefoot, I walk with fear. Fear that there's gonna be something pokey and so my feet are tense and so the tension brings about this pain. Whereas when I walk without fear, it molds to it and it feels actually very soft. And we've seen this like with, with drunk drivers. You know, they say that um, when a drunk driver gets in an accident, they generally don't have very much physical injury compared to when a normal person gets in a car accident, an undrunk driver gets in a car accident, because the undrunk driver, they tense up right before, and so their body's all tense, and then they have the accident, and then their body damages, where the, the drunk driver, because their you know, mental acuity has been decreased by this poison that they've ingested, and so their, their thinking is not as quick, they don't recognize that they're about to get in a car accident, so they don't tense their body, so their body is more fluid. I realized that's what I was experiencing when I would walk, and then I went out and I would do stretches and things like that. Fantastic. At the same time, I wasn't feeling like this super bliss, which I have felt sometimes. I was just feeling really just nice, just positive. And I thought, I, I, I did some thought experience. I went into the mind, and I imagined, you know, like I have recently had some challenging experiences with, with some people who are close to me uh, to where I felt, it has felt like, you know, very aggressive from them and you know, saying and doing things that feel very painful and especially coming from someone close, you know? And thankfully I'm at a place where I don't take that personally anymore. I recognize they're at where they're at and also that it is, partly from me, whatever, you know, there's something that I'm doing I'm not aware of. And I'm able to, to release this, but I, I still felt pain and discomfort with it and, you know, some of that victim story and bitterness and whatnot. So after this meditation, I, 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 I was sitting, I went into, I went back to the room and I sat, lay some more in meditation, just thinking, and I imagined this person and all I felt for them was love. All I felt for them was just calm, pat, peaceful love. And I thought about other people. I thought about Adolf Hitler. I thought about people, you know, who murder people or who rape people or who torture people. I thought about these things and all I felt was love, compassion for them, you know? I don't, it doesn't mean I agree with them. It doesn't mean that I support them. It doesn't mean that I won't work to assist them in stopping what they're doing. If that means I need to, you know, stop them, then I will. But it doesn't, I can still do that with love. And that's what I felt. So that's one experience that I had. Um, so anywho, I would like to share $500 with five people who would like to attend Vipassana. So I, whomever, I'll, I'll share how to sign up. You know, it's a website, www.dhamma.org, D-H-A-M-M-A.org. And go there, you search for courses. Thankfully, this is spreading and more and more people are experiencing the benefit, especially, you know, in, in these times with COVID and like uh, all these different sorts of things where people have gotten really disconnected and they've, they've also not had their normal escape mechanisms. And so they've had to like acknowledge parts of themselves that they've been denying. Uh, as well as in this society in general where we're so disconnected from nature, we're so disconnected from ourselves, so disconnected from peace and silence, we're continually doing things that we don't actually care about, we're continually bombarded with the message that we need to be focused on money and we need to spend money all the time, and we're continually separated from others and said, 
you know, we're feeling all alone when we're surrounded by people. Like in this time, thankfully, more and more people are connecting with meditation in general and also with Vipassana. So the, the courses do fill up. Like I said, it's free. And so often there will be a wait list to just apply. And so the, the first five people that move through a course, I would like to share $500 a piece with, with each person. No strings attached, you know. I, I would love to chat with you after just to hear your experience. I mean, there's things that I can learn as well and if I can support you. And maybe you don't even feel to continue with Vipassana. No, no worries at all. I don't, I don't have any dog in this fight. You know, I just want to share something. And I know that in this current world, there, we can create a lot of stories about, oh, I don't have time for this or that, or, oh, I don't have time, money to take off of work or whatever like that, you know? So I, I want to... I want to assist if I can. My encouragement with this 500 is that you take 10% of it and you set that aside and you use it to do something fun and new for yourself. Uh, and take another 10% and use that to, to share with others. I find that to be beneficial. Take another 10% and use that, put that into savings. But it, you can do whatever you want with it. I don't know if you can if you really use it to spend it on drugs or whatever. It doesn't. It's not for me to say where you're at in your journey. And finally, you know, why am I doing this? Um, because I currently, I'm interested in living in a world, and I, I just, I do live in a world where I don't believe that the stories that we're told, that, that money is this super important thing that is like just as important as oxygen and food and water and relationship are even more important than these things, you know? Like we gotta focus on money no matter what. We need to hoard it, we need to have fear about it. I've lived with that story for the majority of my life and I'm not interested in living in it anymore because I found it's not real and it's not true. And human beings and our experience and growth and healing and love and just fun and sharing is all more positive and more important to me than money. So currently, I, I received some money from the Veterans Administration and I have some money, for, a little bit of money from investments. So I receive about $3,000 a month. That's what I live on. And then I have some savings that I've been going through. As I mentioned, I, I've used a large amount of my savings for evolving as a person. And also I give a large amount away. So currently I still have some savings left and I would like to share this with others. So, you know, the, these, these are currently dwindling but I expect them to last long enough for five people to go through the courses and be able to give away $2,500. That shouldn't be a big deal. So that's what I've got to share, my friends. I love you. Namaste. Enjoy.